Well, <clears throat> welcome to my second edition of In Conversations With. It's a series that um, we started here <laughs> as part of, yeah, In Conversations, hold on. Everyone's good? Yeah. We're good. We're all, yes. We're decent. <laughs> it's a series that we started here over my course as um, artist in residence here on this semester. I'm going to be speaking with invited guests um, just to talk about their everyday experiences in all facets of music. And next up, we're going to have John Bartlett of Megaphono, Catherine O'Grady from the Ottawa Jazz Festival, and also Peter Kankura, who's also from the Ottawa Jazz Festival, but he's also a, a, an instrumentalist here in town. And everybody's just going to be speaking about their experiences in this industry. My hope is that they're going to inspire you um, to help dream about what you're going to do, what life after this program can look like for you. Uh, interspersed with this series, I've been giving a number of master, well, mentor classes. I like to call them mentor classes because I don't feel like I'm a master at anything yet. But the first one we had was um, we had an artist tune-up. We did a, a topic on self-care. We're going to be doing another artist tune-up on March the 10th. And before it was open to instrumentalists, but right now it's open to anybody that wants to come. It's our final time. We're going to be going over how your performances are live and if you want to just kind of tweak things before your final um, recitals or anything like that, I think we can help you. It's a really exciting process. I really have loved doing it with the students and um, looking forward to just kind of seeing who, who's going to come out next. So if you want to join up for that, you can sign up with uh, Jesse. Um, but today I have with me two amazing multi-instrumentalists, multi-genre instrumentalists. Um, this guy, Kevin Bright, <laughs> is... <laughs> I'm looking. I'm, where I'm like, are you? I'm looking at that thing dangling from the uh, light. Thinking, how's it doing that? See, I think it's just floating. I can't even see it. <laughs> how's it doing that? I can't even see it. Now I oh, feel. See, see part of are it? you sure there's something? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, see the, you see the light that's on. No, I confirm. See the light's not working. Go, go right to it. Don't okay. You? See a thing going around like that? No, I'm really. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, time. another guest. Another, <laughs> another guest. Well, so, Kevin. This is an amazing, ma well, yeah, no, you play mandolin and you play guitar. Mm -hmm. What else? That's it. That's it. Okay, so all he does is that. Yeah. But he's so amazing at it. And it's funny because... Uh, clarinet? I, clarinet? Slightly. Yeah, I play a lot of different things, but, but really uh, guitar. Don't ask him to play clarinet. Don't ask him to yeah. play clarinet. But he plays clarinet. Yeah, where is, I'll play it right now. <laughs> I could have brought my daughters. But okay. he, I've always, whenever I've seen you on stage, I've always just been enamored by, I, I know I don't know if you're ever going to think this is good, but I think of it as just this very muscular way of playing. It's very, mm. it's very, I, it's chunky. It's oh. very, and it, but it, to me, those are always good things. And oh, I, good. I just, I love your attack and I love the way that you go about making music. So when um, Jesse mentioned that you were coming in, I was so excited to have you come. Oh, thank on. You. Yeah, and, thank and, you. and I've been having such a fun time going over your music while I'm waiting, oh. while I was getting ready for this. Oh, thanks. You, I don't know. <laughs> well, we haven't met until. We yeah. haven't met until. Yeah. You, yeah, but I did get a chance to listen to your music, and I love your ethereal way that you that you improvise on the cello, and oh, I'm yeah, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you. But you know, I really wanted to know more about just both of you as musicians and how you started out. For me, um, every time I meet somebody and I think about just my own start here in this industry. Um, I just, I'm, I'm so interested in their story, like how they got here. So I'm going to start with Matt. And I know that you grew up with a famous father. Yeah. Um, and a, and a, so you have a famous jazz pianist father, Dave, Dave Brubeck, yeah. and also a mother who was a jazz lyricist. Yeah. And then six kids in your yeah. family. Yeah. And I was reading that five out of the six children became musicians. Yeah. So the first question that I really wanted to throw out to you and be as descriptive as you can. Just what was your experience growing up in, a music, in such a musical family? Did you feel like you always knew you were going to be a musician? Uh, yeah. how, did it, how did it start for you? <laughs> I think uh, I always, well, when you're really little, you don't even know that there's anything else you could do <laughs> besides being a musician. Yeah. When you grow up in a musical family, it's just what everyone did. And, um, but, you know, as you get older, you develop, you know, some other interests. And I thought, oh, maybe I could be a marine biologist. I liked, I liked Jacques Cousteau. Yeah, yeah. And then, so, and then I saw I was, like, into snorkeling. And then I tried, like, to scuba dive. And that was, like, a little scary. And that put me <laughs> off of it or something like that. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it always just seemed like I was going to be a, a musician. Um, yeah, because that was just the atmosphere. That's what you breathed every day. Fam tab you know, family table discussions about music. You know, uh, a lot and uh, listening to a lot of music. Though, I would have to say, and 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 probably you might find this quite common. My father had a pretty extensive record collection, but he. He was 40 when I was born. I think he, he didn't listen to a lot of other people's music after a certain point. So in some ways, my exposure to a lot of other stuff that wasn't stuff that he or my older brothers did was limited. I really had to like find my way, own way to the record stores. Mm -hmm. like, like it wasn't until I got to high school that I really owned my own Beatles albums and then got like Devo and Talking Heads and <laughs> stuff like that, you know? and. Um, so in some ways, like developing my own musical taste might have come a little bit later, you know, than, than some people, you know. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your Yeah, you question. are, totally. Yeah. Like, did you feel like they were really open to you listening to all kinds of music, even though, like, he wasn't listening to a lot of different things? Like, were Yeah, you... I mean, they were open to me listening to, you know, every kind of music. And, uh, and I certainly remember when, like, you know, when Beatles albums would arrive at Christmas time, <laughs> and like unwrapping them is the new sure. one, you know? That was like a heavy thing for the family, you know? Like that was good because, you know, everyone liked that. Um, but um, I think it's the, I think my father, when he s saw that I was drawn to the cello, he was like, oh, please don't be a jazz musician. It's great. So you can play in an orchestra. <laughs> How you, old won't are be you? On, you won't be on the road all the time. You won't be on the phone all the time. And How you'll old get are some you? sleep. I think I started cello, I was playing piano first, and uh, basically because I could read bass clef, <laughs> they kind of gave, the school sort of said, oh, yeah, why don't you play this? And gave me the cello, but I loved it, because, um, I don't know, I just was, I was really drawn to the instrument. I don't know why, I might have just heard someone playing it, I thought, this is what I want to do. So. Yeah, so that's how I ended up being a cellist. But I like I, my standard interview response is that all the good instruments were taken already, right? <laughs> because I, because the piano, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, all of them were gone. They're all taken. Mm. You know, I'm the sixth kid, right? <laughs> so I had to do something different. <laughs> Well, let's look really quick on that. Like you said that your dad was like, oh, don't be a jazz musician, yeah. you know, or did you, even though he was successful, he also kind of was like reticent of you getting into jazz music? Absolutely, because, you know, he and my mother really struggled. You know, they were really poor for a while, you know, and no one, no one wishes that life on anyone, mm. really. You know, mm. so if you really want to curse someone, you give them a trust fund, but that's another matter. <laughs> but, <yeah>. Curse me, <laughs> curse me. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so yeah, I think he was just like, oh, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, it's great because for him, it's like you can, but you still be in music and it'll be classical music and he loves classical music and, but this is like a way that's reliable and not stressful and, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. How about you, Kevin? Like, what was your start in music? Exactly like his. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Security. There's this man bothering us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Sorry. Uh, Thanks, Jesse. Well, I came, I'm the youngest of seven, and my <laughs> father was... We have a lot of comments. Yeah, my father was very, very famous in our town. Uh, See, I'm not sure. The town was 250 people. Okay. Was, <laughs> but my, but I, I uh, you know, my partner said to me, whatever you do, don't let the kids see the transcripts of your, of your school. <laughs> Because uh, and I always thought, you know, through time that I was really a glowing student, and I was like, I was everybody's favorite student, and that when I would, did for a little time go to college, I was their favorite, and that everybody loved me. And uh, when the elevator's door and I came up, everybody stopped and looked at me, and the, and the everybody parted. I'm seeing where this is going. Yeah, but that was not <laughs> that wasn't the way. I, in fact, uh, in fact, looking at it, and I was I really. I, a really a big underachiever. I remember, uh, you know, uh, going to the baseball field and the first time a ball, I remember looking at the ball coming towards me, hit me right in the head. And I thought, this sucks, who'd ever do this? <laughs> and then going to play guitar and I got, a, uh, I got shocked. 
I got an electric shock. And I thought, this really sucks. I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> but I, and somehow in all that, I, I've done well. I've toured the world. I've played a lot of people. And I don't know how that really happened, to be honest with you, because I really, I never really worked hard at anything, to be honest. Like, I didn't. I, <laughs> So school, uh, school, it was, you know, I, I wanted to show the kids how, how much I was loved. And uh, so I saw the, uh, my report card, and it was comments like, we don't know what to do with him. Uh, he daydreams, and he doesn't ever bring home books. We don't know if he can read. He certainly can't tell time. Uh, and he has no, absolutely no rhythm, or he, has, he cannot sing at all. He has no, he, he may be tone deaf. That was, that's what I got, and I, but I, I wasn't actually, uh, I was the opposite actually. But I didn't work at it, and I, I had parents that really didn't care much about it. Like they didn't, they didn't really care if I went to university. They didn't care if I went to college. They cared, they, great, they greatly loved me, but it wasn't that situation where, you know, they were proud of me for, for things that weren't really, uh, didn't have anything to do with fame. Or, like I just, they kind of like, they they got a kick out of me, and they didn't really care. They thought, oh, you'll be okay, this guy. And so I did. And in, in that, I just took up music. And I was, uh, I was crazy about it. And, and I, just, I just thought about it a lot. And I was really um, thoughtful about it. And, I, and that's, that took up a lot of my time, more than actually playing, was sitting there for long, long periods just thinking about it. And thinking, if I did this, what would I do? And then... And the same idea, though, with the Beatle records. That was really big, and we had a big record collection. But I always saw myself in those things. Like, I saw myself as being a Beatle. Mm. You know, I, I thought, I, not that I would ever be a Beatle, because they were broken up, and uh, they, I was too young. But, uh, but I definitely thought I could see myself in the situation of being a musician. Uh, I didn't really, but I didn't, I didn't think I could ever make a living at it. Nor did I think that I could make a living in it. I just kind of went about the people hired me. Okay, can you do this? Sure. Can you do it? Not really, but I'll do it. Yeah. So that was my thing, and I kind of survived. It was a miracle, really. <laughs> it really was. I, I, like I said, I go back to my report cards, and it's really bad. When they graduate, my kids graduate, I'll show them. They'll be amazed. How, like grades that were crossed out, where I actually failed, and it was, it was crossed out to 51. Just to get did, you they, through. Yeah. yeah, they let this guy go through. He has an idea. <laughs> That's it I, for me, yeah. really. I love that. I love that. I love that. We're talking about that in a university mm. setting because, like, well, I'm guessing you didn't go to university. No, I did. You did. <laughs> I was. A, I, I went. I went. I went to college. I went to Humber College went in 1981, and I was accepted in the, in the guitar program. And I was a kid. I was 17 years old, and there was more people in the hallway than there were in my, t in my town. And I went, I couldn't believe it, I was blown away. And I didn't, I, 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 was, oh, I shouldn't say this because it's a bad example, but I quit every year. I, I, I never made it past October. And I would go to school, then I'd get a gig, and then i said, say, I'm going to really do this. And they let me back in, I don't know how that worked. And then I did the second year, and the third year was two weeks. But I did. I am alumni of Humber College. You graduated. <laughs> they, they list you as like you know people that yeah. celebrated <laughs> famous people who went to Humber. I did. Go, I did go. You don't need your. You don't need the paper. No, but I learned a lot there. Uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about uh, packing clothes and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So what's get? Well, okay, what's getting me then is like. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not the kind of person that's going to be like, I don't understand how that happened. Because I actually feel like I do understand how that Great. happened. I understand kind of like the miracle of how things can just work out. Yeah. And how just by envisioning this mm -hmm. idea, like envisioning yourself on stage and it happening and you looking around and being like, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. And I think like what, what interests me is just, I know there's so many people like here in our room and then hopefully the story will go out further than us that are like, also dreaming, also trying to figure out how to, how they got ahead, how, mm. how to get ahead and, you know, just what steps can they take? Yeah. And so, I mean, I get it. It just happened. Mm. And I get it. There's a philosophy there behind there. It's just kind of like, mm. there's, that I feel like there's more. And I just, what is that extra little bit that 
maybe you could help us understand like what is your well, life philosophy that helps you just kind of get things right well it's retrospective at this point i can't go i cannot go back to when i was 20. i can't go back to when i was 30. i can't go back to when i was 40. but do you feel like miracles are still coming at you i i believe that i was meant to be here because i i really meant and i think there's times that there was times i wasn't supposed to be here but i i just had i had a lot of luck and i also had uh it was preordained for me in a lot of ways. Like I kind of feel like, in a strange sense, uh, there was always some sort of angelic thing happening for me. Like I, I, I was never, I, I, not that I ever felt I was either right or wrong for something, but I was never denied entrance at anything. And and uh, and it, it, Toronto used to be a time that if you wanted to get a coffee, you had to audition for it. Everybody auditioned. It was a thing of. The years of the early '80s auditioning. It was just some sort of crazy, messed up power thing that record really? companies had. Yeah, it was everybody auditioned. <laughs> so I was I was 17, and it was a band. And they auditioned everybody, everybody. And I I went to the audition. A friend of mine said, "Where are you going, Roger? You can't go like that." So my feet size are 13. You getting that? And uh, he his size were 10. But they're great shoes. So I put them on. My feet were like this. His pants that came up to here. And he said, you're gonna, you'll get it if you look good. That was the era, really. I look, I look like an idiot. And I went, and uh, uh, they went, I, knew all the, I knew all the guitar players in the audition. They're really great. And they, were, and they should have, everyone, any one of those guys should have got it. And it was a big thing. It was a really, a band that were called the Boys Brigade. And they had uh, Earth, Wind and Fire were going to produce them. These guys didn't even know who Earth, Wind and Fire was. I couldn't believe it. So I got in there. I knew I had the gig. I, not because I was wearing this clown outfit, but only because like, I knew I was going to get the gig. I, I, it wasn't me being cocky. But I could feel when I walked in the room that I got it. Like I understood what they wanted. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Well, I, I didn't I have to. Know that feeling. Yeah, I that feeling. I last year, yeah, too. Yeah. But I think that, so that's what I mean by somewhat preordained. And uh, yeah, I mean, everybody that I've worked for, you know, they, it's been, I never thought about that. I, there's other things I was more concerned about than music. Music was like, I love it love it, I adore it, but that's not the things I'd ever be concerned about, because that's just something that, you know, has been wonderfully strapped on my back, that I, I it's a great way to put it, actually, that I feel like I, I have that, and it's, uh, you know, it's, you know. You, this story seems to have resonated with you, too. What, what were you thinking when you were agreeing? Well, um, I was thinking about, like, Size 10 shoes. Size 10, 10 shoes, shoes. No. it's size, no. ah, that's no. me. I, you know, for me, I think about doing classical auditions and the nerves and the competitiveness and was, who's, who's done like professional classical auditions? Yeah. It's like you're in this room with all these other people playing their concertos and orchestral excerpts and you can hear everyone else in the waiting room and then you go up on stage, and if it's a union gig, it's blind, so they can't tell if you're a man or a woman. They'll actually ask you to take your shoes off. And so it's not supposed to be sexist or ageist, which is fine. That's great. But you're performing, and you can't see who you're performing for. Mm -hmm. It's like this wow. really inorganic situation. You know, It's like the most inorganic music situation I could possibly think of. And and you know, and I got to a point as a I was a freelance cellist in San Francisco Bay Area. So I had my main gig was Berkeley Symphony, which was Kent Nagano's orchestra back then. We were a contemporary music orchestra. But I got to the point where I was actually subbing in San Jose and San Francisco Symphony. I never like got the gigs, you know. And I remember taking the San Francisco Opera gig, you know, all sorts of things. And then, um, but. Flip that around, and you know, and I get a call from a friend of mine who basically says Tom Waits is looking for a cello player for this. So I think the first thing was one of his soundtracks to a Jim Jarmusch movie, Night Night on Earth. It's the first time I met Tom, and just walking in, <laughs> and just you know, getting directions from Tom, and just telling no charts, just listen to the music. Mm. And you know, and you just just 
play something and just be you yourself, right? And then I realized, oh, and I knew absolutely I was going to get the gig. Mm. You know, when I came in there, I was just there, played with Tom. Same thing with the Cheryl Crow audition. That was like a little more formal. Okay, can you fly down to Los Angeles tomorrow? We're like listening to cello players. Okay, great. So mm. go down there. I knew after the first song I had it because here was a situation. Yes, it was Cheryl's or Tom's music, but I could, I could just be myself within that context text you know and that's and i just slowly just became less and less of a classical musician and more of an improvised music musician yeah mm. um so <clears throat> yeah i think so to find your way in music uh, i think it's very difficult but and you could probably relate to this a lot i think you have to find figure out who you are, like who you are as a musician, and figure out a musical situation where that can be represented. And I'm not dissing classical music. I think there's certain people who, who can swim <laughs> in that and totally feel like they are that and they want to be a string quartet mm -hmm. musician or they want to play an opera orchestra or you know freelance and do a lot of different stuff. That's, that's great too. But I just got to the point where I said that, that I'm not really, I'm not, you're aware of your own, you get to a point where you're aware of your own potential and you know that there's something in that musical situation that's just kind of tamping you down a bit. And so you've got to, okay, so I need to figure out some other things where I can just really be myself as a musician. You know? I find this so interesting because it's funny, like when I talk to, say, like a jazz musician who's going to play in a pop mm. context, they don't talk about getting to be themselves in the in that context. They usually talk about and then having to kind of structure themselves to that pop music. Right. Whereas right. you actually opened up in a pop yeah. atmosphere. I, yeah, I mean, maybe... That's what well, I'm feeling. I just find that so interesting. Yeah, I think, yeah, certainly, yeah, it's certainly a funny thing is ironically, because when you go, I mean, you, you can relate to this. When you're on a pop tour, it ends up being classical music. If they want like mm. the solos and things like yeah. thing to really kind of run a certain way, mm. but I also found like whatever solos I did, at least it was my solo. <laughs> you know, sure. like like I, I made it, and then once it was perfected, that that's what I was supposed to do, right? Right. So yeah, I know other people. Like I'm sure a lot of jazz musicians. Yeah, I, I would find it would find like working within the pop context difficult or limiting in mm -hmm. some way but I, I didn't I didn't really and I felt like well I could practice being a jazz musician in the hotel room and I <laughs> know I had some other jazz things to do when I got off tour so so yeah. just kind of looking at that context as being this is that project for now but it's yeah. not limiting me well the thing is is that any different musical situation you're involved in you learn something like I learned not to not to turn down gigs. Sometimes I ended up doing something that I regretted. However, I always find you, there was even something that would just seem, seem silly. You, I always found that I learned something musically from the experience. Yeah. There was something to be learned. Or even just watching other musicians rehearse or how yeah. they figured stuff out. There was something to be learned. You know? <laughs> so. I always I learned things like never do this gig again. <laughs> <laughs> like don't ever make that mistake of thinking that this is going to be fun. I, I, I had a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, I, I had some like that too. Mm. But I, I, don't, I can't think of anything I ever did that there was nothing to be learned from. Except so maybe that weird thing with the trapeze artist that we did. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> that was true. That sounds like a story maybe for after. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, what, how do you feel like your, your creativity is best expressed? Do you feel like it's happen, it happens within a pop context? Or do you <laughs> feel like you have to go to your solo projects or group, other group projects that you create for yourself? Do you feel like you actually can find yourself within a pop project? Well, it has everything to do with the person that's paying you. So you're serving that person. Uh, so when that person, you know, it's kind of funny when you watch TV and you see somebody who's mega big and they're on TV and you look at the musicians and they're jumping around and you think, Nobody really paid to see those people jumping around. They paid to see the person who was singing who wrote the song. 
And so I always, I always think of that, about that, that I'm just there to serve them. Um, it's, and it's, you, you want them to feel like they're being, they're in a nice fluffy bed and you're, you're blanking them. Like you, they, you will not let them down. And, and you take that really seriously and, and you, you make them happy and you talk and you get to know them, they become your friend. And, they, and you're always talking about things like, it could be, it could be anything, but you know, you take what you're being told and you, you, you use that on them to make them feel good. That, that when you get your paycheck, you've done a good job and they, so that, so as far as being creative in a pop context, it is your, it's what you're allowed to do by the person who actually is hiring you mm. and, and their happiness. Because that, it's, it's not about me. Yeah. It's about them. They're, they're on the poster. They're selling the tickets. They're the ones who are in debt with the record company. It used to be that way. But that's, that's, they're paying you to be on their record. It's their words. It's their suffering. It's their, it's their A minor. It's not my A minor. It's theirs. So my job is to look at the words and go, yeah, I can relate to that. Or I say, I can't relate to it, but they're really into this deep. And, it, and it's when, so when the engineer says, how's the headphones? I say, turn up the vocalist. So he or she can hear that I'm listening to them because I'm serving them. And I really strongly believe that that is the key part of working with anybody is your being the rice paper. That when they walk on the rice paper, they can walk through it and it's there's no holes in the rice paper they can walk gingerly across it and you are facilitating their every movement because that's you that's my job and i i i take it really seriously but i'm very very light i'm not a very serious person at all because it's 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 a pain in the ass like i <laughs> I, I i can't play that game of, of being mr serious i i i comes when i I'm, I, I'm never serious, actually. But when I put on the guitar, I'm very serious. I can't kid around about that. You know, when somebody asks me to play, ah, ha, 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 then I'm serious. Because I never had that disconnect with music. I never played music because it was fun. I played music because I was really into it. And I was serious about it. So the idea, you know, I never could take part in the drum circle. Because I think that's bullshit because I people I honestly I, I can't I tried I tried I just I'm play I should I hit the drum once I want to play I really want to get inside it and if I look over and I see somebody's high and they're you mean like a hippie drum circle yes of course, of course. Well, no, not like not like a first nations drum circle so. no I wouldn't be allowed in a first nation yeah, drum circle right, okay. yeah. I'm not I'm not yeah. 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 but the Jesse put one together no, but that's a different situation. The intent, he, and maybe he would give me some, he'd give me some direction. And then I would serve Jesse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I'm saying. So I'd say, I'm going to work for Jesse because he's hired me. And I'd be, ah, make a joke, maybe make a joke at his expense. But as soon as I, as soon as I hit the drum, I'm respecting right. him. Yeah. Because that's what you do with music. You respect, right? That's what I do. And then, but then, I, so I think that to answer the question, is you, you're serving somebody. And that's, they, any latitude that you acquire is from them. And that, and you have no idea what you're gonna do until you sit down with that person. Who's gonna, mm -hmm. And then that changes everything. Yeah, you wanna, yeah, there's, exactly. So then, here you are, you're serving other people, you're serving the project, you're serving the, the, um, the energy and the work then when do you serve yourself? Like what, what percentage would you say of the work that you're doing and that you're creating, and I'm gonna ask you both this question, is it is your own, and what percentage are you working for other people? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter? No, I... I, I you that, don't feel like, oh my gosh, be, I'm not doing my own project. You just wanna be playing. That, that, would be, that would be insane, and that would also be disrespectful. Mm. If I was thinking about me, it, when if somebody else is asked me to come and not so much that way but like it like let's say like do you feel like you would be happy if a hundred percent of what you did was working on other people's projects or do you feel like you have other things that are percolating most of the time that you also like do you feel like you're not happy unless you're also doing one project of your own to the side it's another brain you know it's another part of your brain mm. it's surviving right 
So you, you, you make peace with it. I can't, it's hard to go back on that, but I'm really happy being here. I'm really happy playing with the stretch orchestra, mm. right? Like, I'm really happy to do that. Um, and then I was just here a week ago, and I played with Harry Manx at NBC. And I, I was happy. To do that. I was happy to be there for him. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about, I didn't bring any of my own CDs to sell. Right? It wasn't about me, it's about him. So but I'm happy to do that. If the question is, what would I be happier doing? If I'd be happier being a, a sideman or, or I'd be happier doing my own? Mm. Well, my own, of course. Like I would, I'm, because that's, that's your, because it perpetuates everything. It, you know, it's your, your writing, your arranging, and it's your way. It's your thing, it's your path, it's your, your journey. It's not so bad working with other people too. That's just a different. It's a different brain. It's mm -hmm. a different part of your thing, right? That's what I'm gonna do. So I don't know. If it does. I think so. If I if I'm getting you right, then you very much live in the moment. Mm. And so when you're working on somebody else's project, you're in it and you're 100 percent in it. And you do love to work on your other things, but you're not constantly wishing yeah. you were somewhere else when you're working on something. Yeah, because it would just take away from, yeah. it would really, I, but what I do in my own time is what I do in my own time. So, I mean, after I finish something, I can go to my hotel room and write songs mm -hmm. and then be really into it. You know, that's, that's great. But I think when you're in, in the room, you go, oh, I'm going to make that person feel, feel that they hired the right guy. Yeah, no, I mean, as a band leader, that, um, that's the kind of thing that people want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> you of know. Course, of course. Yeah. Well, how, how do you feel? Like, do you feel like you are being nourished, you know, on, on both sides, like getting to work with other people, but also do your own project? Or do you feel like you're not doing enough well, of either? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I'm juggling many things right now. But uh, I totally agree with Kevin that. If, if you're on the road with someone, you are serving the artist, and you have to be all in, 100. percent And then, the, I've, if you go down that road of starting, oh, you know, I'm just a cello player, right? It's like, man, I wish I got as much, you know, shine <laughs> as a lead guitar player, right? You know, that that'll just ruin your tour, yeah. right? Like, if you get into that headspace, yeah, yeah, they're like, what? Yeah, like, and and I, I must confess, there have been points where I, yeah, you could find myself drifting that way. I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah and then, and, but I, I'm pretty good at self-regulation. Like, I'm pretty good as like, no, get out of this headspace, mm. go back to your hotel room and practice and write some music. Mm. Like, they don't, <laughs> they, you're on the road, but, you know, you can go back to the, you know, you, ha you do have your own time and you can develop your own things. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, re re resenting or being jealous or whatever is just poison, right? Yeah, it's it's no good. Yeah, um, I want to ask you a question. I want to know, because, like, you're super American, <clears throat> as in born in American, raised in America. America, number one. America, number one. Right. <laughs> Especially now. <laughs> but, what are you doing in Canada? Uh, what are you doing in Canada? Um, my actually my trajectory well it's kind of related to my pop touring I did two Lilith fairs with different artists so I got to know a lot of Canadian musicians in fact I first met Kevin when he was playing with Cassandra Wilson mm. the very first the very first Lilith yeah. fair right yeah so I was playing with Jewel it's like back when Jewel made <laughs> the remember, time cover yeah. remember that era before your time <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh and actually, that's where I met Cheryl also. So, um, so I got to know a lot of Canadian musicians, and uh, basically, uh, my wife and I could kind of kind of feel that the U.S. was going down the tubes. <laughs> it was almost like we kind of like. Even though there was like this, this you know, the Obama years. I mean, Obama was like amazing president but stone you know stonewalled all the way and everything he tried to do except for maybe the first two years he had some support in congress but it's like i don't know we just i don't know i just kind of felt like that canada was a canada was a better place to have a kid we, we had a, a kid and we said okay we're just we we have no family here we have no right to be here we just applied we're just immigrants you know 
and we just came. And we let you in. And yes, <clears throat> God bless Canada, they let us in. <laughs> and I know that like not, I know a lot of people, like so many Canadian musicians. Are going to America. Yeah, they say, oh, gotta go to the States, you yeah. know, or whatever. But I think, I think the overall culture is, you know, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just less painful to be in. And yeah, and I know like the center of the musical universe is Brooklyn or whatever. And, uh, but I also, we left at a time where San Francisco Bay Area was getting, it was, it was cheaper to go live in Brooklyn than to live in San Francisco, yeah. right? It was so insane. So it was just, some of it was just like economically driven and just like finding. Go to Canada. Yeah, go, go to Canada. And you picked Guelph? Well, we, we were a few different places before we picked Guelph. It took us a while to figure out how great Guelph was. Yeah. yeah. And Kevin, are you in a rural, a rural environment or a city, urban? Right now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I just moved to Guelph. Oh, moved you moved to Guelph? To Guelph. three years ago. Yeah, we moved. We're up, we're in, we haven't really put down our roots yet. We're still, because yeah, our, our, our children, our children are moving around, so we're moving around. We're following people. So, yeah, so we're not exactly rooted yet, but, but Guelph, I'll stick with that. So how do you guys find making music in a, in a non-urban setting? Well, in a non, non well, a large urban yeah, setting. I don't. Uh, I, don't, I don't make music there. I mean, I, I make music in my house, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't. I mean, I, I, I go out every once in a while and play, but there's no... I don't have any gigs, really. There's some benefits I do. But uh, most of my work is out. Uh, is, is On the road, road. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I have read, yeah, I mean, Guelph Jazz Festival. Like, we're sort of almost, Jesse and Kevin and I are almost like the house band there. At least a long tradition there. Um, but yeah, I mean, very rarely play anywhere in a Guelph venue. I find the same thing for myself. People ask me all the time, you know, about moving to the centers, you know, like to New York or if you're in Canada, maybe to Toronto or right. so like what made you choose not to move to, I mean, you did touch on it a bit, but what made you not follow that call to get to like a place where there would be gigs every day and, mm -hmm. and maybe, cause I know when I, whenever I'm in New York, you know, I'll, I'm, I'll, if I hire a musician, they'll have come from a gig play my gig and go to another gig, uh, which is pretty rare, I find, yeah. in a smaller mm. town. Like, what made you not choose to go to that setting to, to live and create? Some of it's just economic, you know, housing right. prices. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, because my wife and I were just like concretely, like, we're done being renters. Like, you know, there's a certain point mm. where, you know, that seems like money just thrown away. You mm. don't want to do that anymore. So, um, so basically just even, even coming even coming from California and you know arriving it's like we, we looked at some houses in Toronto and it was just like getting nearly as crazy right that's, that's <laughs> so, San Francisco. yeah San Francisco area so mm. yeah so and Guelph just said I don't know it's, it's a nice community so Ottawa seems nice too bigger <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's like I love it because you both are to me, proof of the fact that you can make music and you don't have to be, you can, you can stay where you are. You don't have to leave right. whatever your, your center is That's right. to be successful and to be a touring musician across mm -hmm. the world. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 I've, and I am uh, teaching a lot. So I'm always tied up. I'm in Toronto three days a week mm -hmm. between Humber and York University. So I'm, I'm, not run, I'm not going on the road, you know, September through March, basically, yeah. And that's another choice that you made for yourself to, to mix teaching and performing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, you have a family. Like, there's certain things just happen once you have a family. And, uh, and uh, at the gigs that I had that took me on the road along, I did, yeah, like, the Dixie Chicks tour was just, like, insane. You know, it's like when you do 60, 60 hockey arenas, it is pretty grueling after a while. So, yeah, you know, gone for months. And, I, you know, after that was actually moved to Canada. It's like, oh, no, I want to be around. I want to, yeah, I was, I was, with my son, I was missing developmental milestones. I was gone for so long mm. that, like, I missed first, first words, you know, mm. that sort of thing. So I was like, you know, I, I want to. 
I want to figure out another way to still be a musician, use my brain, mm. <laughs> you know, be able to share my musical knowledge with people, still interact with people musically, but something a, little, a bit more reliable and less crazy making, and I could be home more. And, you know, I'm a homebody. Did you have to make a similar decision? Uh, yeah, but I actually was at the airport a lot. So, because uh, I had a job there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, was, I, I was serving. I'm so gullible. I was like. You really? I, although, I, when I would go to the airport, I'd actually fantasize about having that job. Me too. I just think, oh, I'd love to be that guy. Uh, <laughs> oh, that guy. Like, I don't have to go anywhere. My gear, I don't have to worry about my gear getting one of the. I did, I did both, like I had the same thing as Matt, but I also though I was working, I was living in a small town north of Guelph and uh, for 15 years and I was on the road all the time. So I had that address as being in a small town in Ontario, but in fact I was more away really. So I had experienced that and then I also took a break and was a dad uh, for, for a while. Still a dad? I still a dad. Still yeah. a dad. But a different kind of dad, though. Like, I mean, I had young children. So now my children aren't young, and they want me to go on the road. Yeah, please, dad. Yeah. <laughs> they said that. I don't know what they mean by that. Oh, wow. Are you still here? <laughs> when are you going away? No, they don't do that. But, but I, um, so I've had both. Like, I've had both those things, you know. Uh, and I've had the great uh, magnetic pull to America and, uh, and been there a lot. Did you ever relocate to... Or no, but just there's being... so much that I was, I had a, I had a green card and I wasn't in lieu, I was in violation. Uh, you know, the, the idea you had to have residence in America for six months. I was, I had that because I was always there. I, I joined video clubs, I joined book clubs, I joined everything you can imagine because I was there all the time. Mm. I was hanging out all the time in different, depending where the person who hired me lived, I was there. Kay Lang lived in L.A. Hugh Laurie was in L.A., so I was in L.A. all the time. Nora Jones in Brooklyn, I was there all the time. The people I worked with lived in Montreal, I was there all the time. You know, so whatever people lived, like I, oh, I was there where they were because mm. that's where they lived and they want to rehearse, so I'd be there. And I would have take up residence, uh, which I kind of liked actually. I preferred that to the you know, 60 shows in you know, hockey arenas. I mean, I, I liked having a community. I liked going for my coffee or my beer, and I knew the people at the bar, or I knew the people at the barista. Like, I knew these people. I really, I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And it made it easy for me to bring my family, because I just get a bigger room. And they would, they would just, I said, Dad's gonna go to work today. Bye, Daddy, and they give you a kiss, and I would go to a studio. How fucking great is that? Awesome. Yeah, like, man, I go to I would go to a studio, and my kids would come visit. Dad, Dad, Daddy, hey, how you doing? They they didn't care. And the concept of success, it was they were the you know children are the really if you really want to learn about life, take your kid to a playground, and you figure which character you are. And you say, am I the big kid who won't let the other kids on the slide? <laughs> am I the kid who you want to be? He's a funny one who's throwing. They like can figure out who you are. And my kids were just kids cut right to that, because they don't care. They don't, they don't, they don't give a shit who, the, who the, the fame is. To them, it's just another person who's got dribbling on their chin. <laughs> like they don't, they, they don't really care. And I think that's the way to be. Because you, you put way too, too much of a spin on that kind of shit. And I, don't, and I think that that's, it was great to go to work and to have that. To have the experience, and it, and it really makes you decide what you what you want to do when you get older. And I mean that for me, you know, I'm always getting older. So I, <laughs> when you grow up, yeah, when I grow up, what am I, yeah. what am I going to do tomorrow? So, do you feel like being away so much? Well, I mean, like obviously, it's going to affect your family relationships. So, like, how how did it affect it? Do you feel like you had to make some adjustments to? Did you have to make adjustments? Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah, I don't remember. No. Because it was, it was all that. It was, uh, it was sweet and savory. You know, there was things that were good and things that weren't so good. But I, everybody's okay. Like uh, I did a good job raising these kids, mm. and 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 we we did a good job raising these kids, and I, I think that it all worked out. 
you know. So I, I can easily remember when I put a key in the door of a hotel. I can me, I can easily go back to what it was to be on the road for 13 weeks and what that felt like, feeling disconnected from my tribe. You know, I can totally feel that, but I don't have that anymore. Like I don't, I have to conjure that. Like so, it's all good. Because mm, you know? like now you're more, yeah, you're more present. Yeah, and if, if I got if I got that call again, I would probably depending on who it was, I'd probably do it again, and I would, and then I would go through that pain. Mm -hmm. You know, but I would go through it. I would say, okay. But right now, as we're sitting here, I enjoyed my room last night. I tell you. I did. Nothing like a room on the road for I'm a parent. <laughs> for a parent away, yeah. telling you. Sleep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have two bathrooms in my room. And I, I, what I would do is I'd be lying in bed and it wouldn't feel right. So I got up and I flushed one toilet and I flushed the <laughs> other one. And I could just hear the water both. <laughs> I felt at home. Which one was faster? The one never stopped, actually. It was right by my <laughs> That's a Which problem. Which is okay. I, I, it's okay. I was imagining something else. I was imagining uh, Niagara Falls or something. I think if I'm, when I go home, I'm going to be like, okay, get a summarize. The two of you. Ken was just like, it's cool. Everything's good. Life's good. Things are good. And I think I'd put you in that. You know, you don't seem to, uh, I mean, I don't know you. We just met. <laughs> You don't know the seething, you seem so. seething cauldron. You it. also seem kind of just like, yeah, this worked out. You yeah. know, this is working out. And I mean, like, one thing that I have really been talking to with the students, and I also, yeah, I had Amanda Martinez as my first mm. guest, and we talked a lot about self-care and just how we as musicians, we as human beings, take care of ourselves on a daily basis to be able to handle all the pressures and all, you know, the, the demands and requests. And I think you guys have something, I mean, clearly you've been already imparting. Yeah, just say, yeah, it's fine and it'll work out. And, and I love all that. I mean, do you, are there other things that both of you are doing? I'm, I'll send it out to, to Matt first. Um, what kind of self-care do you engage in? Oh. Hmm. If at all. Yeah. <laughs> How are you so uh, chill? <laughs> are you chill? Are well, you faking yeah. it? Yeah, I'm. Uh, well, I'm a pretty. Re I'm a pretty relaxed person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, but I think I get. I think I get to be relaxed because I because I work on things so that. I try to work on things musically so that I know that I have to worry about them. Or I try to work on some technical things. Like, so, yeah, I don't like, uh, like, I guess, I guess that's part of it. Like, one thing that I was going to bring up with, with self-care is, like, the only time a lot of string players get tendonitis. And the only time I, uh, like, when you're talking about physical things. Mm. And, uh, and, again, the only time I ever got that, I was playing the Flying Dutchman. Wagner in a pit orchestra, which is full of, um, and I got tendonitis in my left hand because he writes 16 chromatic notes with, with one tone. It's all semitones. It'll be one tone somewhere in the middle of that smear mm. of notes. Wow. To, you know, representing the waves. <laughs> like that. Wow. And it was killing me to play this accurately. And but what I'm saying is that, like, if you're alienated from musical experience, like, your body tells you. And like, and I don't know if you've ever had this, but my, my body told me this is not what you should be doing. Like, I didn't want to be serving Wagner. <laughs> you know? There's all sorts of reasons not to serve Wagner. But you know what I mean? It was like I was in, I was in a pit and I was probably and I was probably too close to the other cellist. Like something, you know, if you look in a pit, it's like really hard for everyone. Mm. And cello is the most it requires the most um, horizontal room. Right, because you're both there or there, right? And I was probably like playing like that and sideways wow. and looking up at the, you know, I was probably doing that to myself for three, three to four hours a night, trying to play these, you know, run semi-chromatic runs with one whole tone somewhere in there, right? And I was, and it was killing me. And my body said, <clears throat> so I and I go, I go grocery shopping, and I remember distinctly, like it's sort of a little numb in my shoulder, and I, I, 
And I reach up to grab like a carton of milk or orange juice, and I felt like this Roman candle went <laughs> up into my hand and just went numb. And then I had to grab it with the other hand, and I was like, I just had to stop. And it was like, and so the self care for me is that I got into Alexander technique. Yeah. I, so I learned like you know I'm, I'm I'm sure I'm not my six foot seven plus <laughs> height. I'm sure I'm not a great example of body mechanics. But, but he's dead, I'm sure I stoop and all that. But at the time, what I did is just like, okay, I just got to like get, I just got to get centered and do more what I want to do. And the other thing is that because I couldn't play for a couple of months, then I relearned. I don't know if you had a situation where you, you can't sing. Um, but sometimes you can like, you can retool and get rid of some of the wrong things you were doing. Mm -hmm. Like you, you, so like if something happens is disruptive to your life, you have to like figure out a way, oh, okay, I'm gonna turn this to my advantage. Okay, I can't work, but I can do mm -hmm. some other things. And I can figure out like, you know, I can listen back to some things you're doing or look at some video or whatever and figure out, oh yeah. Because it's interesting, my, my classical cello teacher once said to me, because um, he felt like he didn't teach people how to be a musician. He, he felt like he taught to Zaldo Parise. He said he taught technique. He said, "I made my job is to make sure you are not getting in the way of yourself." Mm. As, right, and and so I had to so I had to do retool and rethink things and make sure I wasn't getting in the way of myself. Right, so so to me, so that physical you know care and then you were doing you you're in, you're getting into yoga now. Yeah, right? do you still? Yeah, yeah. I like it. I like it. Is Alexander Technique a daily thing? Uh, yeah, it can be. When I was doing it, like, yeah, it was, it was a daily thing. And then you go for a treat, treatment and then you work with someone. I mean, basically, an arm, yes, yes. I mean, basically, an arm injury could be solved by, by aligning your, in many ways, by aligning your spine and your back better. I mean, the interesting thing, yes. <laughs> oh, your shoes, the bottom of your shoes look so good. Did they really? Yeah, they're barely, I told them I needed a little height. They're used. I wear these all the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> must be where you walk. <laughs> well, so that was when you were sick. Yeah. But right now, like even today, did you have a, did, like, do you have a daily self-care routine? Do you meditate? Uh, talk to my wife. What would she say? <laughs> what would she say? She's not on stage with us. <laughs> no, no, I'd say like a check in with her. Like, oh, you talk I mean, to your wife? Yeah, I talk to her. Oh, wife. that's a good one. Yeah, I never go. I don't have a like, wife. Are you like that? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I never, yeah, there's always, it's always important to like mm. check in yeah, with your yeah. partner. Ground. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so grounding. It, it really is. And if, and if you're freaked out about anything, which I, and I don't get that freaked out, then, you know, just if you can talk with someone mm -hmm. it's really helpful yeah what about you kevin what you got well give me the question again well <laughs> do you have a self-care routine right you know if i gave you the impression that i was super chill and i'd lie to you i'm not super chill what's going on <laughs> no, i'm very i'm very uptight actually are you yes that's why i've arrived at my findings my experiments in my life <laughs> Well, that's perfect then. This yeah, is perfect. yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't come out of the womb like that. Uh, so my thing is to yeah, be yeah, right. A little bit cautious, but um, but the thing, the only thing I can actually say about your question is, and this seems to work for me, is I learn how to love everything mm. and love everybody. So today, for example, I got up and I walked and I went from my hotel and I walked for about forty-five minutes and I walked to the market. And I loved my coffee so much. And, I, and the guy who served me was a great guy. And I had my phone to get me back to the hotel and I was checking it out and I thought, I'm gonna ask that guy, another guy. And he went and got me a map. And he said to me that it was the first good thing he had done that day. And I thought, what a great guy. So I walked and I knew exactly where I was but I asked somebody else where I was going, even though I could see the street. I had an interaction with somebody, and they were great. Another guy didn't know where he was. I knew where I was going. I'm like, I, I was asking for the street I can actually see, but I just felt like talking to somebody. <laughs> and, and, the, and the guy said he wasn't from around the party. And I said, well, I, I can tell by your, 
by your uh, outrageous accent, you know, because the guy had a very thick English accent. We had a laugh, ha, ha, ha. I borrowed some money from him. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. But, but we Welcome to Canada. Yeah, we talked for a while, and, he, and I said, oh, we from blah, blah, And I'm thinking, and it's cold as hell, and I, but I'm enjoying it. And then the people in my hotel, uh, I ran out of toothpaste. I asked, like, I got some toothpaste, because they have toothpaste, yeah. Where are you from? Ah, I had a conversation. And I, but I loved it. I, lo I, I loved it. I loved my room. So I think, I think, uh, I didn't mind being lost in this building. We, we got around okay, and I thought, you know, did I love it? Yeah, it's all right. We're here, and it's great. We and, learned uh, there was another tower. Mm, yeah. That's how I found this place. Yes. yes that's right. so tower funny. A. Tower A. Tower yeah. B. Yeah. But I think that that's the thing. So when you're on the road with somebody, for example, and uh, you've, you've fought the war and you've gone to bed very late, and you get up in the morning, and you're going on to the next place. And you're sitting there, and that person has a, a post-nasal drip. And you're sitting there, and you're hearing the sound of snot <laughs> going up inside of their cavity. And you just, every morning, you hear that. And you're in this vehicle, and the vehicle's... And you just look, and you see the box of Kleenex. <laughs> and I want... You want to take a handful of the Kleenex. You can do something with that nose of yours. You sit there, well, this is what... This is your little experiment. This is what I do. Is I think, this guy... You know, you know who the guy is, too. I, this guy, I'm thinking to myself, this is one of the most amazing human beings that I know. He's a great, he's one of the greatest guys. Did, and I, th I think it's something he did. And he does things like everybody. He does something good every day for somebody. He does. And I think about this guy, and I think, ah, he's, he's a lovable lug, this guy. Does it bug me that he's not blowing his nose every morning? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. But on the other hand, for me to say, I can't take it! <laughs> Uh, I would destroy him. Like, that would be horrible for him. So I go, ah, what the hell is this snot? Mm. <laughs> no. And we all got it. So I, I, wish, I wish I didn't understand what you're talking about, but I totally do. Well, yeah, because that's a little thing. This is what drives us crazy. Yeah. It drives us crazy that we get in an elevator and somebody, you, you just want to get to your floor and if you're on the eighth floor and somebody presses three and they go, oh, sorry, five. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I don't mean like I'm annoyed. I just mean like I also follow what you're talking about. Right. And so like I'll also kind of come into a room and, and be like, oh, those lights are great. And oh, I love that lady's hair. And I find also that helps me. Yeah. That helps lift me, you know, through the day. But yeah. Well, but I, it is a hard, but, but I'm sure you've played gigs where <laughs> like, you know the espresso machine is like louder. <laughs> like you're about to sing, and then you just, you know. Yeah, but I, I don't look at it like that. I don't hear it. Yeah. I don't look at it like that. Yeah. I look at like, for example, um, in 1998, my first was born. My son was born, and my wife was massive. She had a big belly because she was pregnant. And uh, and she so we so she's in she's in a little we're a little uh, place in Toronto and uh, I just want to make a record because I heard that once you get children it's over <laughs> somebody told me that wrong but anyway wrong. so so Very I wrong. so I'm making records and I'm making one a month and I, I and ideas I just staggering I stagger them over five years that was my stupid idea so I'm making a record and I. And it was a record I made called Empty. And it was all really quiet, national steel guitar record. And I was really into this thing. And all of a sudden, bing! And it's dying out. And the microphone's picking up. And all of a sudden, I hear whoosh, the water in my wife's washing dishes. And I, I'm, I, and I look at the meter. And the meter's moving, because I can see her. And I mean, hear her. Oh! I can't believe she'd do this. So I, God, I'm kind of locked in this little room. So I take the guitar down, boom, and I'm so mad. 
she ruined the I'll never do like this again. She ruined it. There's no key. So I move the microphone. I stand up. And the door, I was in a closet. And the door, you know the closet? The door's just like this. They kind of en envelope, you know. The accordion, you know. Open it up. And she turns around. And she, but she can't turn around like normally because she has a big belly. And so she does this. And she looks at me. She has a big smile on her face. Rosy cheeks. And the big belly. She looks at me like this. And I thought... Man, I'm recording a record in my house. Let bring the noise on because this is what this is my life. Mm -hmm. So if somebody said, "Yeah, I can hear clanging of the dishes," I go, "Yeah, it was my pregnant wife, yeah. who's uh, really, uh, you know, I've been with her forever, and, and this is part of my life. So what am I going for here? I mean, what am I doing? So that was the thing that I learned. Maybe that was my espresso machine, but I learned to look at that and go, "Well, that's a variable of what's going on in my life." And if you make a living in a bar, which I certainly love doing, it's constantly people thinking Clean, clang, when you try to remember words that are being like, ah, 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 on their phones. <laughs> well, I have no, there's nothing I can do but to go, I love you people. Yeah. Because yeah. you paid to come see me play. And I, what am I going to do? <laughs> oh, God. You're destroying it. What am I going to do? So I, I look at them and I think, well, is somebody, it, it, nobody's doing anything to pick a fight with me. They mm -hmm. don't, it's well-meaning. So I, I just best take in the environment. And it's the environment in which I am swimming. You know, and that's, I don't mind it. We're all swimming together and they're part of my process. And I'm, you know, it's luxury. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm very, I have a very similar mentality. Uh... No, I'm sorry about that. No, well, did I have a similar mentality? Yeah, no, we're all right, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you guys a bunch of questions about my phone. My foundation device died. But I do want to, we're going to have this, you know, everyone ask some questions of you after. But I want to ask you guys like, like a few questions that you have to answer super quick because we don't have a lot of time. Okay. Cool? Okay. All right. Not like Proust questions. They are! Oh, they are. But they're my own version. Oh, you're on first. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are easy. Okay. I'm not Proust. Okay. Not <laughs> so. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, good. All right. Matt. Yes. What's your biggest fault? Biggest fault? Uh-huh. Oh. I told you to so be fast many. about it. Oh, okay. Biggest a fault? A fast fault. So I'm tall. That's not a fault. <laughs> uh, biggest fault? Um, uh, self-advocacy. Really? Still not the greatest self advocacy You know, yeah. bottom of six. Well, you're bottom of seven. You don't seem to have a problem with it. But. Oh, it's kids. I don't know what the hell yeah. you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> bottom, ooh. Um, That's what I thought. Yeah. Where, what's your biggest fault? I think I'm too sensitive. Okay. I mean, I can't say no. What? I don't know you. What do you mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do you love most about yourself, Matt? I'm tall. Yeah. <laughs> Very tall. What did you say, 6'7"? Six, 6'8". Six, six, yeah, I'm 6'7", a little bit. I, I'm probably right, hovering right around. I'm two meters. Was nice everybody part. tall in your family? Yeah, but I'm the tallest. I'm the tallest. tallest. Nice. You have to have something yeah. over them. Yeah. How about you? What do you love most about yourself? I love the way I look. Okay. All right. Okay. I do. Yeah, I love the way you look nobody too. Looks, I love, nobody nobody looks, looks like just you. like you. No, I know. <laughs> What's your definition of success? Oh, definition of success is, be, is, is just simply just being happy and fulfilled in what you're doing. It doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. If, you're, if, you're, if you like pulling those coffees and you do really great coffee and people come up to you and say, you're the best coffee maker, that's success. Mm. Mm. Yeah, really. What about you? Family. Tight. Family. Tight family. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone's looking at me like it's a check if it's the right answer. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, good. good. It was good. Um, what do you envy, Matt? What do I envy? Oh. You can go to me first. Oh, people. Oh, okay. you know, Next time, yeah. People, uh, you know who I have any? People who can look at a restaurant bill and split it really quickly in their head. Figure out the tip and everything. You so, envy mastermind yeah. math skills. So, someone, yeah, is really good at that. Mm. All right. 
I envy people who can do a lot of things. You know, the people who say, yeah, I built that boat. What else you do? I did my taxes. What else you do? Uh, yeah, I got that great record I just did coming out. I think those people can do everything. Renaissance people. Yeah, I think that's like people who can do a lot of things with, with, uh, with uh, very little, really. I mean, you're, you're able to just take things and build it and be interested in so many things. I envy that. Mm. Okay, I'll give you the next one. What do you regret? What do I regret? I have many regrets, actually. Uh, I usually regret things that I say uh, that I, I wish I hadn't said. Anything like, today? No, you're good? No, I don't. I, I, I spoke truth. I, I, well, I feel okay about <laughs> That's that. That's what I was hoping for, truth. Yeah. 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 What do you regret, Matt? Um, I would say the same thing as Kevin. I don't know, it seems like a cop out. No, just I think like it's fine. The, usually the only big regrets in my life are like the yeah, a few hours later saying, Yeah, that was probably not the right thing to say. Yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot, you know, mm. by saying things that you shouldn't have said. Really? And, it, and yet it, it rolls off a duck's back, you think. But it really doesn't. You know, it does it doesn't do that. And it's, I mean it's better to say something than it is to write it. You write something to somebody, mm. even if they deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> what decision did you make that you really celebrate? That I really celebrate. Either anybody can answer, whoever thinks they, can, they got it quick. Wow. Decision? That you can celebrate. Well, um, again, you know, there's a thousand in a day. You turn, you. I went that way today, and because I went that way, uh, I found a great coffee place. That was a really great decision I made. It, it, it formulated my whole day. It's not small potatoes, it's large potatoes. I, and there's some things I'm going to do today that's gonna, that, that are gonna, is gonna make me feel good, that I can, I can alter an event. I'm going to tell you what it is because it's, it's pissing me off to know it. All right. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, it really pissed me off. Uh, and I'm really mad about it. I've been on the phone actually all day about it. So I went to Steve's music and. Uh, ah, geez. Yeah. Ah. I'm and kidding. Though, I love Steve's I'm, music. Well, no. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, actually. no. I, I, I went today and they were, those guys, they were nice to me, but they were very cruel. I, 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 I phoned their head office today. Did they not have the right thing? No, they had all the right things. They just they didn't do the right thing. They didn't say the right thing. They were very cruel to to uh, somebody who walked walked in front of the store, and I was so mad about it. And I and I did articulate that, but I didn't go for the juggler. I'm very good at going for the juggler, and I didn't because I wasn't comprehending it. So this I will make good on. I will go and. I'll do some damage today. You, uh, <laughs> but you're not advocating for yourself. You're advocating for somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah. That'll make me feel good. Hmm. So that's a decision. That was your question, right? Yeah, like what decision that do you make that you really celebrate? So you decided to advocate for somebody else. Yeah, it's on my phone. It's, I just have to press the button and I'll have that. Send. My head office. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you have something you really celebrate? I really celebrate. Uh, a more like a personal thing or a more career Anything, thing? Anything, any decision. Anything? Yeah, career yeah. decision would be okay too. Uh, yeah, there's so many. Uh, I, well, I'd say I'm really glad I didn't I didn't give up on the cello mm. because I think it would have been pretty easy to just throw in the towel and just say I'm going to be a bass player. After mm. all, they work all the time. Do they? So <laughs> I own a bass. I play the bass. There's a lot of transferable skills. But I'm really glad I stuck. Yeah, good one. Stuck with what I did. Yeah. Because I chose like it's like it's almost like it's it's, it's actually an insane choice when you think about it. Really? Yeah. In some ways, but. It was just like, yeah, do the thing that's like, you know, that's more rare, you know, that, that was, I mean, I, 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 I'm oh, glad cool. I took the path that was, had a lot more potholes and rocks and meanderings. We are too. Know, to, We're to, glad to you get, did too. Yeah. I'm really glad I did. Yeah. Oh, um, what do you believe about yourself and the music industry that when you first started that you no longer believe now? That it exists. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Okay, <laughs> I had to kind of make my okay. No, yeah. it doesn't no, no, exist. No, 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 it doesn't exist. No, 
I'm fishing waters with no fish. Mm. It's true. Not debatable. Not debatable. No. Not arguable. <laughs> it's true. Okay. I'm not going to argue with you because I don't want you to go get angry and send the message to head office. No, I'm not angry. <laughs> I, I, it's a great puzzle. It's a good puzzle, but it's not. It's not. It happening. doesn't exist. No. Not. Okay, so rephrase, say, say the question. So what do you believe phrase. about yourself and the industry? Oh, I didn't answer that industry. question. You did! Okay. When you, that you, you know, when you first started, yeah. that you no longer believe now. You did, totally answered it. Yeah, yeah. I know how to speak. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I mean, I think when I was coming up, just the, the paradigm of how the whole thing worked was just so different, you know? So, I mean, I think all of us have been a little shaken. That was first. It was like Napster, and then actually, Kevin and I were talking about. It's like they used to act. Here's here's one thing. My dad used to always instill in us. He said, if you really want to, you need to figure out a way to make money with music when you're not physically able to do it. So, having your intellectual property was really important. And now it's like. Everything's crazy, you know. It's like Pharrell Williams, like, what, what did he say? How much money? Like for Happy, like with the the downloads, like oh, right. he, he, I think he said he only made like twenty five thousand dollars on that song. When you think about how pervasive in our culture, you know, I know the man has enough money. He's plenty successful. Mm. And then Kevin and I are, we're talking about like the pennies that Stretch Orchestra has got, you know. So I I think that you know the streaming services, you know. And how, and I think that the major record companies have sold, you know, people, the artists out in that way, the songwriters and, mm. and the players. And so, but the funny thing is, I, I just think that, that there is no money mm. for people unless they're like massively famous. So it's now it's not just coming back to who can play well live and who. Yeah. It's it's just down. It's funny. It's all just come back to actually, can you play well live again? Right. And will people mm. come? see it mm. so it's in a way it's come a full circle in a, in a strange way so like the record industry became the industry and then it's just it's self-destructed <laughs> and you know it's it's a very different thing mm. you know uh, uh i would be like if i was coming i'd be the first person to be like trying to be you know like getting getting on youtube and just yeah. bypassing the whole thing all together. Yeah. Wow. Well, I guess I want to ask one last question. Are you happy? Do you feel you can make the right choice? And I think you guys have answered it, but I mean, maybe just to. It would be funny if we said no. I know, <laughs> right? It'd be like, what? After, After all, all this? That. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, did you make the right choice? Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, guys, um, thank you so much for coming to uh, to speak with us. I want to open it up to the audience to see if anybody has any questions. But before we do, I'm just honestly floored. Yeah, oh, happy. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. you. You had the hard job. Me? Yeah. I don't know because I think it was just uh, I really just was curious about both of you. Mm. Um, I wanted to know. I think like you know every time I come out. I go out on the road and I'm constantly doing interviews, but nobody ever asked to interview my band. And yeah, these musicians much. are so interesting. And yeah. I get to be on the road with my musicians all the time. And it's yeah. always a great hang and we talk a lot. Sure. And I know that they have so many great stories. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to ask you about your dad, your dad, your dad. I want to ask you about you, uh -huh. you know, and I didn't want to ask you about anything else, but just like your experiences. Yeah. And I wish I'd had more time to ask about, you know, and other things too, but yeah. I wanted to just, sit down like if, if we were all at my house talking and have everybody get a chance to ask questions well, too. Well, you're, so. you're very accommodating and very... Uh, well, thank you. That's yeah, nice of you to you. say. Does anybody have any questions? Did I ask all of them? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question. Sure. That beard, man. I know, right? That's a serious beard. That's a, that's a beard. <laughs> you could grow things in that beard. What's that? You, you could grow things yeah. in that beard. <laughs> that was enough. That yeah, was that's enough. Great. You could hide a person in there. It's a fantastic beard. I want to have a really quick question. Um, oh, you have a question? Oh, yeah, dude. <gasps> Yay! Sorry, I came in late. Go Sorry. ahead. I had a missile. But, um, 
As for for you, Michelle, is, um, um, is there a lot of work for classical musicians in the popular music world? I think there's more. I think there's more and more. Um, the you know, like the big tours, a lot of people are like taking along, you know, string sections and so on. Um, I didn't do anything. I didn't. I always did things where I was actually a band member, right? So I didn't do like uh, one of those with like those twenty string players, right? Sort of thing. But uh, maybe to flip around your question, what I do think is that if are are you a string player? Yeah, I'm a double bass player. You're a double bass player. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I, I think that um, you know, there's there's. It's really hard to like get that full time like orchestral job, and you're, are you going to be freelancing or whatever? And if you can figure out ways to to learn to play, you know, to play by ear more, it's going to open up some possibilities of like other work, and it can be you know really some really good experiences, you know. And um, so I yeah, so I'd say the short answer is this: I think that there is more than there ever was. Mm. I think. Yeah, it is nice. Do you feel what kind of advice do you have for your students? Like when, or do you teach as well? No. No, but like, so what do you? Thank God, no. What do you feel like your kids need to know? Like your students, like that you every year you're seeing the same students. What are you trying to impart? Okay, well, here's the two things. During rehearsal, stay off your phone. <laughs> That's what I impart. Number one, uh, I'd say that funny, but I'm I'm thinking about. Like when you're in rehearsal, whether it's in the garage or an academic context, you have to be 100% there. Like people, like I, I, and people really, you know, as a sign of respect to everyone else in the room during a rehearsal, you know, it's not, you know, just because the bass player and the drummer are getting something together doesn't mean you can go on your phone and not listen. Because mm -hmm. you may actually. Because the guitar player is on his phone. I'm not playing the guitar. This is an example. May actually actually have say the right word that might help them get their feel right. But they're worrying about some other rehearsal email or or looking at Facebook or you know whatever. So like that's one thing I would impart to people is whatever you're doing, be a hundred a hundred percent there, even if it's really boring. Like I, in my classical music rehearsals, I, you know, I have to sit there for a while while they're rehearsing something else. Check out the conductor's technique. Like, don't just zone out because it might mm. be boring. You're not playing. Watch how the oboists like cleans their keys. You know, they take their cigarette paper. Like, you can learn a little bit about like re wind maintenance or whatever. There's always something going on. That's really so. Be like aware and focus. Mm. That, and I would say also if you're your ear is your friend classical players yes they use their ears they use it for intonation and if they're trying to learn how to improvise or whatever it's like you know trust your intuition about what your ear tells you is right you know a lot of people don't trust their ears right so um i try to impart to people that um People, some people totally like fear. I work with a lot of people who they come into it like fearing improvisation, and I said, just remember, like, if you're a classical player, you are improvising. And then they said, no, I'm not. I said, yeah, you no. Know. It's because if you're playing well classical, you you've learned the notes. You know where to put your hands. You know when to blow, when to phrase, when to bow, whatever. Um, but you you have to learn how to be more in the moment, and that's the level of interpretation. Right, you know, you have to make a phrase breathe. Right, so if you're going to study improvisation with me, let's let's like let's work on uh, let's work on this Bach solo piece. And first thing, let's improvise a little bit about how much time you take doing it. Just today, like where that's also being in the moment and being present. Being aware of your musical circumstances, what's going on in your, in your life, and all—not being distracted by worries, but like, how do you feel now? Has to get expressed in your music because the, the, all the people who are great classical musicians just listen to—they're communicating where they're coming from and how they feel now in that music, hmm. right? 
And that's really no different than jazz playing. Mm -hmm. It's just like what is considered to be the material for improvisation is, is different, right? You both have the same message. Oh, that's good. Well, well said, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's definitely, I think that there's like this strain that has run through this whole entire talk about being present, being in the moment, experiencing life as it's coming at you, mm -hmm. um, take, you know, looking at things kind of from a positive perspective. You know? Yeah, I, don't I know. agree. <laughs> no. You, you, you know, no, I totally agree. I think that you can save yourself a lot of money and a lot of time, and you don't, and actually, you don't, if you're going to buy, uh, you know, uh, Eckhart Tolle book or Thich Nhat Hanh, you want to find out what's the secret of life. Any Buddhist monk, it just comes down to, you'll save yourself a lot of money. You don't have to read any of their books. <laughs> and I, no, here it is. I'm going to tell you right now. And 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 because I've I've looked around, and and this is what what it is. It is just be here. That's everything. Yeah. So you put on your shoes. Really, really look at yourself tying your laces. You're going to have your coffee. Really taste that coffee. If you did two or three things a day where you're actually, if you really have, if you really feel your hands on the steering wheel, it's a different experience, actually. You just, about three years ago, I went to Moscow, and uh, four years ago, and, uh, and I met a bass player in Vancouver, and we were going from, I was with Hugh Laurie, and we were flying to, and he said, hey, I have a number of this guy who's in the space program in <laughs> Moscow. And he, great guy, he's a friend of mine. His name and number, and he, got, and he, you know, he loves the fact there's some Canadians. And there's only two Canadians on that tour. So Dave Pilch, who's a bass player, both he and I are in Moscow. So Dave and I go, we meet and we have the number of this guy. And we're gonna meet him at the, at the space station in Moscow. And this guy meets us and uh, we go and, and we have a beautiful time with this guy. This guy's name is Chris Hadfield. I didn't know Chris Hadfield. Nobody knew who Chris Hadfield was. And we went and we hung out with this guy. He's a big music nut. And he took us around and he had a lunch with three cosmonauts and him. And he, he is, is interpreting Russian. He, he's, he's doing all, he's amazing, this guy. And so we're just talking. And we're talking about life. We're talking about stuff. And these guys are amazing. And we're, we, we were actually in the space, the space station that he was in. It was a replica of what he was in. He showed us, okay, so we're talking. And I asked, I asked a very stupid question. And, and it, got, it actually got interpreted wrong. My question was, was there anything out there you couldn't explain? I meant it literally, like a, like a, like a flying saucer. I really didn't mean that. But I came off looking so heavy because I looked like I was talking about metaphysically. And they, they took it that way. And one of the guys said, and I'm so happy because I'm so happy that wasn't, it just blurted out of my mouth and I couldn't catch it. <laughs> and one of the guys said, I was looking at the earth and I was thinking of the earth in conflict. And then I'm in my car, I'm back to earth, and I'm sitting in traffic and I got my hands on the steering wheel. I look over and I see people yelling, screaming, honking their horn. And I thought, I've seen this. I looked at love from both sides now. I, I, he, this guy saw it. He saw it by looking down at it and it wasn't worth it. And the, he said the feeling of his hands on, the, on everything, the purr of the engine, he was just in that moment, a perfect moment. And I thought, you don't have to really go at a space station to look down at it. It's so flavorful and it's so beautiful. And it is, life really is great. And it isn't shitty. And this, if you look at the thing with Donald Trump, it's just a snapshot. No big deal there. It really isn't. It's no big deal. He'll be gone. He'll be gone. They all go away. It doesn't matter. When he goes away, it doesn't matter. And there are really good people who voted for him. They did the wrong thing, but there are good people who voted for him. That wall will go up, the wall will go down. It's just a stupid wall, it'll go down. And we have to always keep that thing. You're playing the guitar, it's so beautiful. You're playing the cello, it's so beautiful. We're just here for, a, we're here for the moment. He's doing that. I, by the way, I, th I thought it was Wagner. 
I didn't know it was Wagner. <laughs> so, uh, but, no, no. so he's playing this. I thought, I thought it was Robert Wagner. Yes, right? Robert <laughs> Wagner. So, so yeah. he's doing he's this thing. Composer. He's doing the whole, that whole tone thing. That's a beautiful thing. He has a pain in his hand because it's a beautiful thing. He worked on it. But it's a beautiful thing. And I think that, that if we can actually every minute be in the treat yourself to three moments a day. That's a, that's a great thing, actually. It's, really, it's a really simple concept. And it's, we miss the beauty of our kids. We miss so much because we're so caught up into the, we didn't get that perfect loaf of bread. Our coffee was cold. Keep him by the coffee. Whatever it is, it's not that big of a deal. It really isn't. Uh, um, you know, so that, I think that that is a, it's, you save it. I just saved you a lot of money. <laughs> Thank you so much. You don't have to get that book. I don't, I, yeah, no, I well, yeah, I have it, but it's like don't have to read it now. No, but <laughs> mine's a brochure. This is, yeah, you got a brochure. <laughs> this has it's been a, what are so good. One side of the pamphlet. This has been so good for me, and I think like one of the things that scared me a lot during this <laughs> series is um. <laughs> have you heard her sing? No, they don't know anything about. You heard her sing. Singing. Cause she's you played with me. She's a, she's a beautiful. She, this you are a beautiful singer. Thank you very much. Yeah. You are a beautiful. Singer. You are a beautiful. Singer. I think I come at it also in a very similar way, just kind of trying to be in the moment, and I you sure look it. Tried to come at this series as well. I mean, I felt a lot of nervousness, you know, initially thinking like I don't know much about much about them, but I wanted to just be in the moment with you guys and ask questions as they came and not being on the next question, but kind of yeah. thinking about what you actually said and have a conversation oh, yeah. with you. That's I'm, always the worst interviewer. We just have a list of questions. You just answer, and yeah. They, and they just, yeah, the, and they, no matter what you say, they just go through the sequence. They, yeah, They're and not I, actually in the moment. I'm sure I missed a it's bunch. Like, they have a list. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, ask that. Where were you okay. born? I was born in Ontario. Next, next. next door neighbor <laughs> to Lee Harvey Oswald. So yeah. when you went next? to uh, yeah. what about <laughs> you missed a part about the other well. He's my you neighbor. Know? He makes his kids. I miss you kids. Anyway, so you're <laughs> that would be awesome. Guys, please come back. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. they have a, a master class with Jesse Stewart. They're going to be playing music from their stretch orchestra well, you guys at come three o'clock, right? Three o'clock. In, in three o'clock. KM Theater. You'll see us in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I, moment of chaos. I'm so honored to share the stage oh, with you, to you share man. this moment. We this is one of my three moments. And, uh, and thank you guys so much for coming. I know that you don't have to come. So it's always a pleasure to see people here. And uh, thank you for being here. I don't know if the guys will stay around a little bit if, they, if you have any extra questions. But we'll be back again next week, March 10th. Who's to, with you? Uh, well, no one next week. Next week it's going to be an uh, artist. Like we do a performance tune up. Oh, nice. Yeah, but then next we'll have John Barrett of Megaphono. And he's going to be talking about. A lot about like what we spoke about today, just the changing industry. And I mean, he's been a record label owner, a manager. He's now running a, a music conference. So we're going to talk about how in the industry we have to learn to turn on a dime. Mm. Like, yeah. we, and you can't be the Titanic. You need to be able to move yeah. quickly when the, the right. weather changes. I know, and that's why the big institutions fail. Because the bigger the institution, the much harder it is for that to, yeah, make to, that turn. to pivot. Yeah. Right? Whereas individuals can mm. pivot. And he seems to be a master at doing that. And we just, I just wanted to, one of the biggest things I've always wanted to talk to you guys about is just that you may not be a musician at the end of this. You might have to go into the arts. You might want to go into the arts admin. And there are other aspects of being an artist, just singing or playing music. And also, even though we are musicians and we are performers, we also have to know how to manage ourselves and promote ourselves. And, mm. and so those are the other people that are going to be coming in to talk about those other aspects so yes. we can so. learn all these things. So yeah, thank you very much guys, yay!